Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Enrique Hasso. I'm the director of the Texas Medical and Dental Schools Application Service located in the Texas Health Education Service office in Austin, Texas. Uh, as an organization, we serve 21 member dental, medical, podiatry, and veterinary schools across the state of Texas. Uh, I'm really honored today to be welcoming the team from the UT Rio Grande Valley School of Podiatric Medicine. Uh, just to give you a quick rundown of where we currently are on the application cycle, today is uh, Friday, March 10th. Uh, the TMDSS match happened about a week ago, and so several of our applicants for medical school received an offer uh, to a, a participating member in, uh, medical institution. So congratulations to them. Uh, but unfortunately, as nature of the application cycle, some applicants get offers and some don't. And we're here to uh, kind of remind you that the entry year 2023 application cycle is not over yet. In fact, if you did not receive a match to a medical school uh, uh, last week, you actually still have the opportunity to add one last school to your entry year 2023 application, and you can start your medical education journey this fall. Uh, and so I'm really pleased to uh, welcome again the UTRGV School of Podiatric Medicine team. Uh, Dr. LaFontaine, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and your team. Thank you. Uh, my name is Javier Lafontaine. I'm the Dean of the School of Podiatric Medicine in UT Rio Grande Valley. Then we have also Dr. Javier Cavazos. He's the Associate Dean of uh, Academic Affairs for the school. And then Gilbert Maureen and Luis Chavarria, they're the members of the, uh, uh, Mr. Maureen is the Director of the Admissions Office and Luis uh, Chavarria is, is Join us, join us recently into the admissions office as well. Welcome to you all and particularly to you, Luis. Uh, welcome to the, the TMDSAS uh, train uh, and it's going full speed ahead. Uh, yeah. I, think, I think everybody has joined at some point or another, so we're, we're happy to have you here to help the prospective uh, uh, podiatrists of Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, as a reminder for this session, uh, you're welcome to submit your questions if you're watching us via Facebook or YouTube live. Uh, we will hold on to your questions until the end of the session. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and let the team from UTRGV School of Pediatric Medicine run the show. So here we go, Dr. LaFontaine. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, and uh, Enrique, for having us uh, participate in this event. Uh, this is the second time we've done this. We did it last year, uh, too. Uh, and I think it provided a lot of insight on, on uh, uh, what podiatric medicine is. Um, so with no further ado, I'll, I'll, I'll welcome you all to, let, you know, let's take a step into podiatric medicine, a little bit of what it is and what we do. Um, uh, many of you uh, probably are aware of uh, the UTRGB School of Pediatric Medicine uh, opened his door, their door, uh, our door on uh, August uh, 1st of 2022. That's where we have the first cohort um, admitted to the school. But I think interestingly, what people sh should know is that it's the first podi uh, podiatric school in Texas. Is the 11th uh, podiatric school in, we are the 10th out of, of the 11th podiatry school in the nation. And we are the only state funded institution in the United States. So the other uh, 10 schools are, are private. They are affiliated to some universities, but they're, they're private school. Um, we are based out of Harlingen campus in UTRGV. The main campus of UTRGV is in Edinburgh which is about 40 miles from Harlingen. But being a state funded institution, we have the low, uh, low cost tuition. Financial assistance is available, just like when you apply to any, you know, the medical school, osteopathic school and so on. Um, we are approved to, uh, or we are, we, our candidacy status is appro approved us for 40 students. And our first cohort uh, are 27, out of 40, and that have a small caveat. When the school received the, uh, uh, the candidacy status last year during the summer, it was in June 9th. So from June 9th to August, we recruited 27 
uh, student, which had, they are doing great. It's actually, we were able to, the events like this, to be able to, to get everybody excited about podiatry uh, as a career. But what's, what is podiatric medicine? What a, a, a podiatric physician do? Well, we are, the, a, we are a regional specialist. So we take care of the foot and the ankle. So being medical management, be surgical tra uh, treatment of the foot and ankle, foot fractures, you know, tendon ruptures, inflammation, ingrown toenail, diabetic care, everything is involved in what we do. And many of these ailments that we see in the foot and the ankle are related to systemic diseases, such as obesity, diabetes, arthritis, a peripheral arterial disease. Uh, we do, many of us do trauma, sport medicine. I mean, so it's, it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's management of, all the ailments that, that take takes care of the foot and the ankle. But our motto, we live by basically is keep America walking. And basically us here in UTRGV, we, know we wanna keep Texans walking. So, but what do we do? Well, we work in different places. We work in private practices. You can have your own office like any other medical specialist. You can work for specialty groups like uh, multi, multi doctors, you know, we. Often you're part of orthopedic groups, vascular surgery group of mostly specialty groups where there are internists, cardiologists, podiatrists, endocrinologists, surgeons, you know, just pretty much everything. Um, academics, like here, you know, obviously my career, for example, I spent most of my career in, in medical schools as a, as, a, as, a, as a clinical faculty. I was blessed to have the opportunity to join a podiatry school, but there is academics pretty much in, in any, you know, any part, you know, across the United States. Many podiatrists do work in the VA system, in the Indian health system, uh, in research, in, in many areas where, where they do mostly administrative work, also and clinical, obviously. Uh, hospital base, we have some some podiatry that work in the health plan down here in the valley. We have a, one of the chief medical officer of one of the hospital down here is, is a podiatry. So you, you know, you have a lot of variety of what, what you're going to do uh, if, if you become a podiatrist. Now, just to give you an idea, podiatrists, just like any other medical specialty, we are in need, you know, where physicians are getting older, podiatrists are getting older. The population is getting older, so we need people to take care of the profession and take care of an older population as well. But this is, you know, this is just give you an idea of a ratio of Texas population per podiatrist. So if you're going to go to practice and you're going to open your practice today, you're going to have to show the bank that, that, that you're needed, that your services are needed, your product yourself is needed. Usually about one podiatrist per 18,000 to 20,000 is what the banks want to see. You can see in Texas, if you go to a metropolitan area and you open your own practice, you're probably looking about one to 25,000 people. But interestingly, if you go to non-border towns or smaller towns, not, you know, it's about one to, to 25. But if you go to non-metropolitan towns so or border town, you can see that that uh, ratio, it just increases. So we are in a shortage of, 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 of the, you know, of podiatric physicians. So there's no question that, that if you become a good uh, podiatric physician, you should be able to have a very successful uh, practice and lifestyle if that's what you decide to do as a, uh, uh, as a podiatrist. But I just told you some, you know, some of the reasons why to become a doctor in pediatric medicine, you know, short of a physician where, you know, there's an aging population, doctors are, are aging. And unfortunately, a lot of the problems that we do for, that we take care of, do a lot of, have to do with acute problem, but a lot of it, like medicine is, had to do with chronic diseases, like I mentioned earlier. One of the good things about our profession is that we most of the time deal with situations where they're curable. So patients come in with pain, they live without pain. You know, patient come in, you know, to, with the ingrown toenail, you remove it, you fix. You know, you have a fracture, 
you get fixed, eventually you get better. You know, same thing with working with kids, you know, as what we call podopediatrics, you know, you, you are able to change life immediately. You know, you're not dealing for the most part with, with life or death situations. But is a doctor of pediatric medicine, right? You just have an education just like a medical specialist. And I go into a little bit in the next few slides uh, uh, in a little bit about what the education entails. But you can, you can go from a medical specialist to practice in your office or subspecialize quite a bit. I'll talk to you about that in, in a little bit within, within foot and ankle care. And you have the ability to become an entrepreneur you know, just have multiple offices or, or you know, own a group and, and so on. And it's, it's very rewarding, just like I mentioned earlier, right? You take people out of pain, you keep people active. It's, it's a very financially rewarding um, um, a profession. I'll show you at the end a few cases that might give you an idea of, of how rewarding the profession can be. Um, but there's different places, right? I already mentioned a little bit about where, where podiatrists work and so on. This is probably a little bit more detailed, but I, in general, you can get you can get the point uh, uh, to that. So how podiatrists get educated? Well, the first two years are very similar to medical school, dental school, osteopathic school. You know, you get your classroom instruction here in UTRGV. We have a modular system, so you don't have a class biochemistry, but you learn biochemistry within the clinical context of medicine, right? Otherwise, we'll send you back to undergraduate college and repeat biochemistry, right? So we want to give them a background of where biochemistry or histology, for example, fit on the clinical aspect of what you're going to be doing. So, but you can see on the slide, right? We can do, you do anatomy, histology, biochemistry, and so on. We have incorporated in our uh, curriculum problem-based learning, which means that you, a uh, couple of times a week in the afternoon, the students meet and with, with, the, with the facilitator, we discuss cases related to the topic that you're being taught. So you can apply it in a clinical scenario from year one. And I think that's very important for medical education. So traditionally when I train, you know, you, it was textbook the first two years and the first time you encounter a patient was in your third year, you know, so, so what we're trying to do with this education is to get you earlier into the clinical environment. So, so you can learn the in and outs of being a doctor early in your career. But importantly, you need to know that including that basic science that what, what I'm discussing, you also have of podiatric medicine and surgery and biomechanics module that lasts for two years. So in a way, you are probably a little bit busier than actually medical school because you're learning also what is specific to podiatric medicine. But, you know, that not to scare anybody. I think we have good mentor, good, good student support. So you can understand and we can support you to make sure that you get successful. Um, in completing your podiatric education. And then your third and fourth year, very similar again to any other uh, medical education is where you do your clinical rotation. And your clinical rotation are not just to podiatric medicine. You have to do family medicine, internal medicine, general surgery, orthopedics, emergency medicine, and so on. Because even though your scope is not to treat hypertension, you, if you're going to be doing surgery, you need to understand what hypertension is and how it's gonna affect the outcome of your patient. So it doesn't really matter if you're gonna treat it or not, you have to know at the same level that a medical doctor does, does uh, uh, like they would be practicing. Now, once you complete, um, once you complete your, your residency, your, your, your what we call undergraduate medical education, then you have to do a residency training. And your residency training is three years. That's what we call podiatric medicine and surgery. It's 36 months, it's three years in length. And the residency pretty much emphasizes on all aspects of podiatric medicine and medicine and surgery on primary care, biomechanics, and surgery. Okay, so you will distribute your 
all the rotation within a 36 month period. Now, this is a map here showing you um, basically where, uh, let's see, here. This is, a, this is a map showing you uh, where are Texas, they are, where they are podiatric residency in Texas, where there is located there are seven programs. Um, when this map was produced, I think there's still seven programs up till now. So you have San Antonio, that's the one in orange. You have few in Houston area, one in, in Temple, Texas, uh, the other one in John Peter Smith in Fort Worth. There's one in Dallas area. Um, and obviously one of our one of our commitment to, um, to uh, accreditation is that we have to generate podiatric re uh, residencies uh, in, in the Rio Grande Valley too. So, uh, and help expand these other programs. So um, that is just to make sure that as we produce more students, they have you know, places to go and, and complete their postgraduate medical training. This is a map showing you, I just showed you this briefly earlier, where all the podiatric school are located. Um, you can see there's a, we are the 10th one, the one in the orange, but the one in 11, this is one that just got candidacy status. That's in Pennsylvania, Lake Erie, and that actually the, the 11th school, and they're open the doors in this coming uh, fall. Um, in there, there are, couple in, in California, one in Arizona, one in Miami, uh, Chicago, and a couple in the Midwest, Ohio and New York and so on, so on. Now you also have the opportunity to do fellowships. So you can, like I mentioned earlier, you can sub-specialize, right? So, so before I came down here, I was in UT Southwestern. So we have a diabetic limb salvage fellowship. So whoever completed a three years residency program and they have an interest specifically to diabetes, diabetes care, then they will go and do another year. So you can do the same. You can do that in sport medicine, pediatrics, geriatrics, surgery, uh, including trauma, foot and ankle reconstruction, you know, correction of limb deformities. There are few fellowships that you can do imaging uh, and, and there are few that you can do infectious disease. So just not because it's foot and ankle, you can, you only gonna be doing, you know, just general podiatric, you know, medicine and surgery. You can actually so specialize and build a niche of what you really enjoy within the foot and the ankle. These are the demographic of what currently we have. I told you earlier, we have uh, 27 students in our first class graduating 2026. Um, they are uh, currently, 32 accepted out of the 40 that have accepted a position. Uh, and we are in the process of, <clears throat> of uh, doing, you know, doing uh, interviews as, you know, as, as we speak. You can see the it's a very diverse school. Um, uh, you know, half and half is it goes into male, females. And we have uh, on this current cohort one, student out of state. Um, and then in the, so far the one incoming, we have one out of state. We can only admit four out of the 40 or 10% of, of the cohort uh, can be out of state. That's, that's just a maximum like any other uh, uh, UT system um, uh, medical school. Which are the requirements of admission? Very similar to dental, osteopathic and medical school. We we require to at least have 90 hours of college credit. Uh, most of the people that apply uh, have a bachelor's degree. Um, we, you know, we want to, to, to the applicant at least maintain a GPA of 3.25 in, in the science area while they were undergraduate. Obviously the NCAT um, uh, is, a, is the admission test that we, we we accept and, you know, see like how your application looks, right? We try to keep it very holistic. And when I, and I, when I say holistic, I, I'm sure you hear from everybody, but we really truly do that. You know, we have that, our admission committee is large. We have everybody in it. We have 
team from the admission office, from an assessment office, basic science, podiatrists in faculty. And we really look at each, each application uh, um, you know, in, in detail. So we want to see clinical research, leadership, community engagement, why you did something, why you didn't, you know, obviously the error of recommendations are, are always helpful when we go through, uh, uh, through, these, through, through this process. This is some of the things I show you. This is, uh, um, you know, this is a diabetic patient. Obviously he came in with an infection. He had an amputation. Uh, these are some of the things that uh, we, you know, we tend to do. We, you can do procedures in your office, like an ingrown toenail. You know, this is nothing that needs to go to the hospital. Obviously, if in elderly patient, we do, you know, try to keep people, di diabetic patients to, to prevent, um, you know, problems. So, yeah, so we, we can do from trimming toenails, removing them, callus to amputations, uh, debridement like this. You know, this is also uh, based in the, this is a, outpatient treatment room, somebody came in with a small ulcer and, and we decompress it and then you start doing wound care on the, on the ulcer on the foot. So that's a big part of podiatry of what we do. You know, we do wound care, but also you can do trauma. You can, you can see this, you know, bimalleolar fracture fix uh, with internal fixation. This is people, somebody with a chronic arthritis, uh, some fusions and implants. It, that fails. So uh, these are patients with a calcaneus fracture or heel fracture. And you can do bunions, you know, you can you know, have a runner like in this case with a painful bunion and you kind of fix them, you know, elective surgery. So, so there are many things you can do, you know, and obviously uh, one of the beauty of what we do in our profession is you have the ability to control your lifestyle, right? So if you want to do what I show you, fix ankles and, you know, do amputation, you're going to have a very busy practice because all these things come through the ER, you're going to have to do call, so you you have a different lifestyle. But you can do wound care or you can do procedure like an ingrown tunnel, you can do orthotics or insert for people feet, do sport medicine, you know, that might be a kind of a better lifestyle, you know, practice where it's going to be financial rewarding because, right, I mean, there are 30 million people in Texas, there are 60 million feet, right, and not everybody needs an amputation, not everybody needs a fracture, you know, there's a lot of the, the every, you know, what we call, you know, a bread and butter, uh, podiatric medicine you can do and still be financially rewarding. But there's just some of the contact information, DPM admissions at utrgv.edu. You got our website. It was, you know, recently revamped. So you'll probably get a lot of information. That's my email. You can shoot me an email anytime with any questions. And, and I guess we'll, we're open for, for questions now. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lafontaine. Hopefully those of you watching, uh, I know I cringed a little when I saw some, some pictures of some of the ailments, but if it's any bit fascinating to you, then this is truly an area that you should be exploring. Uh, I think one of the coolest things about podiatric medicine is, as Dr. LaFontaine mentioned, there are still so many different, there's such versatility with, with, that, with that career path. You know, uh, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you can go into, into surgery, you can go into outpatient care, you can go into uh, preventative care. And I think one of the most exciting parts of having a podiatric school finally in Texas, and most importantly in this region of the country, is the, the prevalence of diabetes and other ailments that really impact several populations. And I think podiatric medicine is really interesting in that it, it's particularly concerned in maintaining uh, an active lifestyle. Uh, cool. And I think that's something that's really exciting. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Cavazos, do you have any additional insights you'd like to share with prospective applicants? And I, I know Dr. Lafontaine kind of mm -hmm. ran us through the gamut, but um, you know, perhaps any insights on, on the curriculum? Sure, absolutely. Um, well, first, let me just say that um, I think that being a before coming here, uh, 
to the UTRGV School of Podiatric Medicine. Uh, I did practice here in the Rio Grande Valley for about 25 years. So coming from a from a clinical perspective, I think that uh, the medical aspect, the diabetes and the role that podiatric physicians uh, can play uh, definitely can give you that sense of belonging and acceptance uh, from uh, other uh, uh, areas of medicine. Uh, it is a team-based uh, approach. Uh, if we are going to have success in dealing with the comorbidities of diabetes and the, the, the serious consequences uh, that occur in the lower extremities. So uh, I can tell you that in my career, it was, it was very, very uh, uh, gratifying because you are part of that medical team. You are involved in the hospital selling, setting. You are dealing with vascular surgeons. You are dealing with internal medicine. So uh, that, that sense of belonging and the sense that, that, that uh, you're part of the team is something that I think was quite uh, uh, promising and quite uh, beneficial. As far as the curriculum is concerned, uh, you know, it is uh, an intense program. It is extremely comprehensive. Uh, our students uh, will take your traditional basic uh, uh, medical school curriculum in the basic sciences. Our um, podiatric curriculum component uh, has a clinical setting embedded from the beginning. So we try to, uh, uh, in, our in our classes and in our courses, try to uh, teach our students very early uh, how to think like a physician. So uh, overall, I mean, I think it's, it's a great program. Uh, it, it will be challenging. Uh, it will keep you busy. It will keep you motivated. But as they say, the light at the end of the tunnel uh, is that you will be a very well-accepted physician in the medical community. Yep. Yep. Very well said. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, Gilbert, would you mind sharing some of the pathways that applicants have available to pursue this pathway? Yes, well, uh, first off, I do want to mention our application deadline. It is March 31st. Um, some of the pathways, I mean, it's the basics in getting into medical uh, school. I mean, you will have to have your uh, basic sciences. Um, the GPA, I do want to make a correction. I think that uh, Fontaine had mentioned the GPA was at 3.25. Um, our sciences are actually at 3.2. Um, but yeah, so you will have to have um, your biologies, eight hours of biologies, um, general or inorganic chemistry is a, a minimum of eight hours, organic chemistry as well, a minimum of eight hours, physics, eight hours, and English and uh, communications, anywhere from six to eight hours. Um, statistics, we did make that optional. Um, uh, uh, prerequisite courses must be taken at a U.S. Uh, accredited uh, institution or university. A minimum of a 3.0 GPA in the last 60 hours towards uh, your degree. Um, we, we are also DACA friendly as well. So this is an opportunity that stu uh, students that probably um, never thought that they had a chance to get into medical school, they can now apply and uh, be a part of a medical school. Um, applicants do must, uh, must be U.S. citizens or permanent residents. We're currently not accepting any international students or transfer students at this time. Um, another thing that I do want to stress, and I think that uh, uh, Fontaine had mentioned, uh, we do have the lowest cost of tuition out of all the schools. So that's something that's really great. The tu tuition, uh, it is affordable for everyone. There is financial assistance available. We also currently offer um, institutional funding, such as the Texas uh, Public Education Grant for Podiatry, and also the Graduate Tuition Assistance Grant for Podiatry. Mm -hmm. I think you're muted, Enrique. Sorry about that. I was talking to myself. Uh, and so uh, obviously for, for this application cycle, uh, this is now the second class uh, that will be going through um, the UTRGV School of Podiatric Medicine. Um, and so looking not at somebody who may be applying this year, uh, but perhaps three, four years from now, you know, somebody who's just started college, uh, what in, in uh, advice do you have for them that would help them uh, 
you know, organize their undergraduate career to optimize an application for podiatry school? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that um, just having an overall mix, um, you know, community engagement or volunteer service is very important um, role as far as for being a uh, part of a medical school. Um, clinical experience or research experience is also beneficial. That way you can get an idea of the sciences, um, you know, and leadership, you know, be a part of your undergraduate program, whether you're, you're volunteering in, um, you know, or being a leader as a treasurer and, you know, for human resource management or, or even the science club, all of those are great um, components that we look for in a good medical student. I think it's important to, you know, identify a, podi a, po a podiatric physician that you can uh, shadow, you know, and, and visit. So at least, you know, maybe, maybe couple if you can, so you can see the difference of, of the scope of practice that you could do. You know, I think that is that that is uh, very helpful, you know, so you can be comfortable that, you know, that whatever you're gonna be able to, to do in, you know, I say forever is something that, that, that you know, you get enough information before you make the commitment. So I, be, I think, be, be, you know, visiting a podiatry, spending, you know, a couple of days with a couple of different ones, I think is a good idea. Excellent insights. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so just as a reminder, if you are an entry year 2023 applicant who applied to medical school in TMDSAS and didn't previously apply to the UTRGV School of Podiatric Medicine, there is still time for you to add this, uh, this school to your application. So uh, since the podiatric school deadline is March 31st of this year, uh, if you did apply to one of our other medical schools through TMDSAS, you have the ability to send us an instant message through the TMDSAS portal and let us know that you'd like to add this school to your application. Uh, since it's already been processed, our team just has to uh, go ahead and transmit your application to the school and you would be in contention for one of the spots available to start uh, podiatric medicine, me uh, podiatric medical school this fall. Uh, if you have not started an entry year 2023 application, uh, but are still interested in starting this fall, uh, you are you, you do still have the ability to go ahead and submit an application. Just go on to the TMDSAS website. The first image that you see on uh, on our website is actually going to take you to instructions to help you start your application to podiatric school uh, and be in contention for something that you will start this fall. So uh, still some opportunity. We have about three weeks, two, three weeks left uh, in the application cycle. Uh, for future application cycles, what does the timeline look like? For future application cycles, will open our applications will open up um, just as the other traditional medical schools in Texas around the first week of May, I believe the May third for this year, all the way till March thirty first. But um, we're trying to align our application cycle to that of the national application systems, um, so we're still navigating through the process on there. Great, thank you. Um, so I've got a couple of follow up questions. Uh, for you, Dr. LaFontaine, in, in preparation for this pathway. You know, we're mentioning that somebody who may have been preparing for medical school uh, perhaps hasn't received an offer yet this cycle. What mm -hmm. advice do you have if they haven't shadowed a DPM? Well, you know, if you if, if you haven't shadowed a, a, a DPM, um, I would definitely uh, go to several of the websites that um, that provide uh, good information. So you can probably go to uh, www.apma.org. Uh, you can go to www.acfas.org. Uh, uh, Dr. Cabasso is the president of the American College of Pediatric Medicine. It is, I think the website is www.acpm.org. Uh, A-C-P-M-E-D. Oh, acpmed.org. And you can also go to www.aacpm.org, which is that's the American Association of College of Reactive Masons. You know, you'll get enough information there, you know, and in, in from different angles, right? ACFAS is very surgically oriented. ACPM 
is basically podiatric medicine in general from diabetes, podopediatric, geriatrics, medicine, you know, everything. And surgery too, because it's a, it's a comprehensive association, you know, and then the APMA, you get a little bit of the poly, pol, you know, politics, you know. So I would really inundate yourself with a lot of information. Um, and then once we do the interview with your, you know, a, a, a good, you know, a good candidate, to selection, then you can ask us and email us. You know, send them. You know, send me an email, and we'll we'll, we'll give you enough information. You know, to to make a wise decision. Wonderful. I'm adding these links uh, to the chat. So if you would like to follow up on that, um, please feel free to uh, go to abpm at www.abpmed.org. Uh, or the ACPM, the American College of uh, Podiatric Medicine, at acpmed.org. Uh, and then finally, the last website I heard was for the American Association of Colleges of Podiatric Medicine, and there's aaccpm.org. Mm -hmm. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, let's see, we've got another question here. Uh, what would you say to a pre-med student who's deciding between becoming a physician or a podiatrist? Is there a difference in the consideration for them? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's a good, that's a great question. I mean, and, and, and I probably let uh, Dr. Cavazos you know, also, uh, I, I think we, this is something we talk about every day. I, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. If you, if you are considering to be a physician and podiatrist, they, I think there's two things you want to think about, you know. Podiatric, podiatric physician is going to be foot and ankle for the rest of your life, right? So you're going to, you got to be comfortable. Now you can do a lot of things like we talk in the presentation with that. But if you, if you want to do surgery, the only way you're going to be able to do it is medical school or podiatry. If you want to do bone surgery, right? There's no other profession that's going to provide you that. So, so the surgery you do is, obviously, it's going to be just toward the foot and the ankle. But, but it's a very hands-on profession, right? So... Even though you're practicing in your office, you're doing always something with your hands. You know, it's not, you know, it's not the profession that, you know, you're going to look at blood work and I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to increase your Lipitor and decrease the, you know, you're always going to be, you're going you're gonna to have some of that, but you're always going to be using your hands. So, so if it's something you enjoy doing with patients, talking to them, doing a little bit of surgery, doing a lot of everyday working, orthotics, shoes, debriding, you know, small surgery procedures, I think it's a way more gratifying uh, uh, profession. Yeah. Another aspect is the work-life balance uh, and opportunities for uh, both male and female, uh, in particular, if uh, alternative uh, options or, or alternative planning, family planning. Uh, I think that uh, podiatric uh, medicine gives you maybe a bit more of a leeway, not much because podiatrists have very, very long hours. I know that when I was uh, uh, pitched on uh, work-life balance and that I was going to work 40 or 50 hours a week, uh, there were, that didn't translate. I was working 60, 70, uh, 80 hours a week in particular the first few years. But, you know, as you become more experienced, as you develop your practice, uh, I think that you will have the opportunity to uh, potentially have a better work-life balance. Uh, and then the other the other uh, aspect is that uh, because it is so diverse uh, in, in, in areas, there's always, or there, I, I think that there's more likely a, an opportunity for you to have, uh, give patients instant gratification, instant pain relief. Uh, and I think that over the long term, you know, when we deal with things like physician burnout uh, and dealing with with extreme 
uh, medical conditions, it can definitely take a toll on a, uh, on a physician over the long run. Granted, you know, we, we ourselves that deal with the diabetic foot and diabetic management and dealing with amputations, that also takes its toll, but uh, it's not like we're dealing with, with cancer or other life-threatening situations on a daily basis. Excellent points. Uh, Gilbert or Luis, anything to add? I know y'all probably get this question often on the road. <laughs> we get all kinds of questions. Um, so we accept all disciplines. So that's one thing that's unique about us. Um, um, it's not required for students to have an undergraduate degree. However, we highly encourage for students to have some type of undergraduate degree. Um, just in the event that you decide like maybe the first two years that the profession is not for you, you can easily choose another career path or you know already go into a different uh, graduate program. 98% um, of all students that do go into podiatry um, do have some sort of undergraduate degree. As long as you have the minimum requirements um, to get into podiatry, uh, you can be accepted into our program. Great. That, that casts a pretty wide net for folks out there. So I'm sure uh, I hope somebody's listening, making the decision here. Uh, I have one final question for you all. Um, could you paint a picture of what the ideal characteristics for uh, the perfect candidate looks like for pediatric medicine? You know, when when you were creating your your formation documents for accreditation, you know, what was your ideal candidate and what did they look like? I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I, I think uh, when I look at an application, I, I think uh, I, I first get attracted to applicants, not even their grades or the first thing I, I go into is just what they're done. I mean, where, where they come from. I think people that have shown interest with the community, you know, have done some, you know, you know, volunteer work, leadership, you know, they, you know, you can see they're outgoing. They always participate in, you know, social events. You know, you don't have to create events, but you're always outgoing. You know, I think that's important. And I think it's an important quality to be a good doctor, a good podiatry, a good surgeon, good dentist. You know, you just, your day is, is customer service every day in people that are suffering for whatever reason it is. So you have to be a person willing to help, compassionate, you know, that is positive. And that's kind of what you want to get. I mean, I think that is what, it's hard to get it from a paper, but that's what you're kind of looking for. And if you have that, then, you know, GPA, MCAT, all that is obviously is part of the, of the whole package, you know, but, but I think that's, that's what I get, you know, focus on. That's kind of what I'm looking for. And just to piggyback on Dr. LaFontaine's, I mean, those, I think those characteristics are often overlooked, which is what we call the behaviors of a physician. And we try to, we incorporate that in our curriculum, but developing those communication skills, developing those uh, personable skills uh, is really what at the end of the day separates an outstanding physician from, uh, from, from, from a, a regular physician. Uh, so, as Dr. LaFontaine alluded, you know, those experiences that, that has allowed you to hone in on communication skills, leadership, participation, being involved, community service, all those, whether you realize or not, are honing in those communication skills that are going to be ever so important. And, of course, the academics is important because, again, the program is extremely rigorous, uh, you know, and, and uh, we look at we, we definitely look at, at those aspects as well. But I would agree with Dr. LaFontaine. Uh, communication, personality, uh, development uh, is is probably at the utmost importance, and then grades uh, and uh, academic rigor is probably second. Wonderful. I think you both made a great case for how holistic review works. I know too many applicants, too many questions come around. You know, what does holistic review look like in practice? You know, I have a perfect MCAT score and a 4.0 GPA, why, why didn't I get an acceptance? And it's it's really because of the consideration of everything that's in the application. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I think at the end of the day, holistic review is just kind of the guarantee that the applicant won't be
be rejected or accepted on one specific item on their application, but rather with the entire context of their application. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, something I'm, I'm taking away from your response to, to my question, because my question was a gotcha question, uh, is that there is no cookie cutter podiatrist out there. There's no checklist that you can that you can go through. You know, obviously you have to take the MCAT and you have to get a certain amount of hours and make sure that you're doing leadership activities. But if at the end of the day you're you're choosing to use your gifts, your abilities to help others through medicine, through uh, your abilities in the sciences, I think this is a, a, a very uh, uh, powerful opportunity for a lot of folks. And so mm -hmm. I hope that they hear this and. and uh, uh, get their applications in by March 31st so for consideration. That way they can start their journey this fall. Yep. Great. Great. Any, any final words of encouragement for our applicants? I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I think if what we're done today in 40, you know, 45 minutes, uh, and you feel that this is a, you know, a possibility uh, for you, you know, Contact us or submit the application, especially if you already have it in Tamdas. Just have it forwarded to us. You know, we'll review it, get back with you. If you get an interview, we'll talk to you. And if you find that it's not for you, it's not for you. That that is okay too. You know, but but it's hard to get all the information right in in this you know in, in this event. Or, or, although I, I think it's been helpful for many. You know. I think it's easy to get to us if you really consider pediatric medicine. One thing I want to mention uh, before we go is that we don't have any secondary application fees. So that's very good. You know, just to, mm -hmm. for everybody to save some money. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds so, good. and it is, it is two interviews too. There's an open interview and a blind interview. If you are selected as a, as a prospective candidate. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at dpmadmissions at utrgb.edu. Great. Thank you so much. I want to make sure I caught that. dpmadmissions.utrgb.edu. Yes. Great. That's in the that's in the chat, so you can, you all can get the email from there. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, while on the topic of saving money, I, I, one one item I forgot to mention earlier, uh, for those of you that did submit an application to TUNDSES this cycle already and already paid the $200 uh, application fee, adding UTRGV School of Pediatric Medicine is uh, included in that application fee. So there are no additional fees for you to let us send us an instant message and let us know, I want to get my application to UTRGV School of Pediatric Medicine no charge at all. If you did not start your uh, entry your 2023 application, you will have to go through the entire application process and submit your application fee of $200 for entry year 2023. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you all so much for your time. Um, uh, you've, you've provided some really insightful uh, uh, feedback into the entire career, into your school, and uh, really clarified some of the questions that I know I've encountered uh, as we go out and talk to our applicants. Uh, some, some great takeaways here, obviously, adding the, applica uh, adding the school to your applications free of charge if you've already submitted, no secondary application for the school. There are two interviews, and really this pathway closely shadows the same pathway for preparation as a medical applicant with the MCAT and having those GPA requirements and the education requirements, or even for a dental applicant, you would just have to go out and take the MCAT uh, in addition to having had the, the DAT. Um, no, Enrique, I wanted to add too, just quickly, you know, I think we might be able to help some of the applicants, like uh, if they write to DPM admissions at utrgb.edu, uh, we could potentially, and correct me if I'm wrong, Gilbert, we could put him in contact with some of the students we have. Because I'm sure our cohort, we have students this year that went through the same thing some of you are going through. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so we could potentially put them in contact and, you know, get the student perspective. Oh, that would be phenomenal. Uh, again, uh, 
send send an email to uh, DPM admissions at utrgv.edu. It's in the in the chat here. Uh, I think that's a fantastic offer because you know you all speak so highly of the profession, but you'll get the real the real insights from from yeah. applicants who've been through this journey. Um, and even uh, for that first pool, you know, a lot of them didn't even know that there was a pediatric school opening in Texas, and they went ahead and, and sent their applications in. So if you're on the fence about this journey, definitely take them up on this opportunity to talk to some of the applicants mm -hmm. or some of the students there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, wonderful. Well, again, thank you all so much for your time uh, and, and these wonderful insights. Dr. Cavazos, great to see you, Dr. LaFontaine. Luis, uh, once again, welcome aboard. And, and Gilbert, we'll see you on the road, uh, helping to recruit the next generation of podiatrists. <laughs> we'll see you every day. Thank uh, you. Thank you. So on behalf of the UTRGV School of Podiatric Medicine, TMDSAS, and the Texas Health Education Service, we'd like to wish all of you all the best of luck. And if you have any questions, you definitely know how to get a hold of all of us now. Uh, if you have any questions about your application, again, send us an instant message or an email at info at tmdsas.com. And we look forward to seeing your application. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.